right now we're going to hear from three inspiring speakers who are going to start bringing this idea of the commons into our collective vocabulary. Uh, and they're going to be exploring three different aspects of what that might mean. So it's my pleasure to welcome Craig Ambrose to the stage. Good morning. So I'm, I'm Craig Ambrose. I write code with Inspiral Craftworks, and I grow food and await the zombie apocalypse at Atama Eco Village on the South Island. Um, so we've got uh, people who are going to inspire you in a sec with ideas for a wonderful and open future. It's my role this morning to play the role of the ghost of Christmas past, drag you back a few hundred years and tell you some tales of things that didn't go so well. I'd like you to journey me on a bit of a, a journey with me to the 18th century, perhaps. Imagine yourself living in 1700. Unless you're one of the 1%, you probably work in a manual trade of some sort, possibly farming, possibly some sort of manufacturing. Industry at this point is distributed, but specialized. You probably work in a cottage industry in a small building. And by the end of that century, things will have completely changed. I know in this crowd we have lots of entrepreneurs and startup folks who love to use the word disruptive. And this is the start of the Industrial Revolution. So this is the era of disruptive technology. What do you think the first disruptive technology of the Industrial Revolution is? Give you a clue, it's not this one. Everyone thinks of the steam engine as being important. But 50 years before James Watt invented this steam engine, or not that one, but a steam engine, this was the first major disruptive technology of the Industrial Revolution. It doesn't look very exciting. It's a stick with a bit of wool in the middle. It's called a flying shuttle, and it's, uh, it's used for weaving. It's an upgrade for your loom. So if you're weaving on a loom, a loom is used for making cloth. It has threads of yarn that it arranges in one direction called the warp. It separates them for you, and you have to pass a stick with some wool around it through to make the weft which give you some cloth. The difference in using a flying shuttle is that uh, it, the shuttle sits at one end of the loom, you yank it with a string, it flies through to the other end and you catch it at the other end. So it makes you a lot faster and it means you can weave cloth that's wider. You don't have to have cloth that's only as far as you can reach. And this dramatically changes the textile landscape in Britain. Textile production at this time is, is distributed across the landscape. If you're a weaver, then you probably work in either a small workshop or you travel from farm to farm to do your weaving. Just about every farm will do some sort of fibre production. So in Britain we've got wool, we've got cotton and linen. And uh, it, it's gender segregated. The men of the farm might shear the sheep. The women and young girls will spin the wool on a, on a hand spinning wheel. And a man typically will come and weave it. Possibly a travelling weaver who'll come and set up the loom on the homestead for a few weeks, weave all the the family's yarn up into cloth, and that becomes one of the lasting stores of wealth for this farming family, because just about every other product to the farm um, is perishable, whereas the, this, this cloth that you've made, this is your store of permanent wealth. The, um, the difference now that the flying shuttle has been invented is that this weaver who comes, they're weaving twice as fast now. I don't mean twice as fast just in that, in that bit, I mean their yearly production is twice as much, and you can imagine but that, that, that's quite an incredible technology. That's the sort of technology that really enriches the commons, saves people labor and drudgery, because it, it achieves this massive efficiency gain, not with any new power source. It's not burning coal. It doesn't require you to upgrade the operating system of your loom. It doesn't require you to throw away your loom and get a new one. It's just a clever idea. You can build this, that little stick at home, or you can ask your village joiner to make it for you, and now you are twice as fast. So that's that's the sort of technology that enriches our commons. But when it's implemented, the effect is like you might imagine. If I provided a way for you to get to work in the morning twice as fast, that doesn't mean you get to sleep in more, typically. Generally, over time, what it means is you're now expected to look for work twice as far away. So society tends to adapt to eat up any efficiency gains that we make. And uh, the benefits of these technologies are usually not distributed evenly to the people who need them. I didn't really want to talk about that so much, though, but to emphasize the economic and social implications that this disruptive invention created. With half of the weavers, well, 
with all the weavers now working twice as fast and effectively half of them now out of work in a century where being out of work typically leads to debtor's prison, there's tremendous social pressure to see the other parts of the weaving supply chain go faster. So we want to get this wool spun twice as fast now so that we can use the surplus capacity we've got in the weaving industry. There was a, a race, if you like, to develop a machine that could spin the wool faster than the young girls of the farm working away on the spinning wheel by hand. And this is the first machine that was invented. This was invented by uh, uh, James Hargraves in um, 1764. And this is called a spinning jenny. The, um, the legend has it that, that Mr. Hargraves was watching his daughter spin on a spinning wheel and the spinning wheel tipped over sideways and he noticed that it, it still kept spinning for a little while and it certainly still worked while horizontal. So that's probably not true. But this has a horizontal wheel. You, you crank it by hand and it pulls through rather than just one bobbin, it pulls through, in this case, 16 bobbins of wool at a time. It's limited, doesn't have a person's hands to help do the job, and so it can only do certain types of yarn, not as, not as strong. So you can't make warp thread out of it for weaving, but you can make the weft thread, that's the one that goes the other way. So half of all, half of all thread production can now be done on this. The, um, the, the spinning jenny was invented, you know, somewhat in secret, Mr. Hargraves, decided not to patent this invention. Patents were around at the time, and um, instead just built a few of them and had his workshop working faster than everybody else and tried to keep it a secret. He must have known that perhaps uh, James Kay, who invented the flying shuttle that we saw earlier, had patented his invention and really spent the rest of his life trying to enforce that patent unsuccessfully, ended up dying a pauper in France after a life of legal battles. So the... Um, the Hargraves, who invented the spinning jenny, um, he ended up just selling his yarn more cost effectively, which went well for a while um, until eventually the, the low prices of, of yarn in his town meant that he angered a lot of the hand, weave, hand spinners who broke into his house, smashed all his machines and chased him out of town. <laughs> this is the next machine, maybe 10 years later. This is the spinning frame. Um, so this, is, this invention is credited to Richard Arkwright, now later Sir, Sir Richard Arkwright. Uh, he uh, collaborated with, with James Kay, who we heard of earlier, and um, Thomas High in, in Nottingham to produce this machine. Arkwright, unlike the others, wasn't an inventor or a woodworker. He, he was more of a businessman, an entrepreneur. He didn't really invent these things himself. And, in fact, it was, it was later alleged that he largely stole other people's inventions to come up with this. Um, but this, this machine is, is, is a much more mature technology than the last one we saw. It's got uh, rollers that replace the hands when we, we spin by hand. So the, the first machine just dragged the yarn through tight bits of wood. This one has rollers running at differential speeds. It, it can really spin any sort of yarn. And this is really the start of, of uh, industrial textile production. Operates on much the same principle as a modern ring, ring spinner, which is used pretty much up until the late 20th century. So this technology is this, a, perhaps a better example of the sort of thing that is valuable for our society to create. This, this machine now out of patent and in the commons it is yours. If, if you want to spin some wool into thread for some reason, don't go and get a spinning wheel. Build one of these. This is, this is your machine. And it's, it's much more efficient than a spinning wheel. And you can, you can still make this for much, much the same complexity if you really want to. The, um, this machine, of course, was, was patented by Arkwright. He had a lot more business sense. Um, and um, when, we, uh, when we let someone have a patent for a machine like this, we're, we're essentially rewarding them for this contribution they've made to our common technological understanding. So the, the idea is that a, a patent is a necessary incentive for invention, that people won't come up with inventions like this unless we award them some special reward. The trouble with, the, um, with using patents for this mechanism is we're awarding them the, the right to license the machine, which they use to get money, but also by doing so they get control. So this 
we're looking here really at one of Arkwright's early prototypes, not one of his production machines. So you can, you can turn this machine by hand or attach it to a small water wheel or a horse. Um, and that would have been useful in, in any village across New Zealand. We can imagine the folks who are working in, in small mills or out of cottage workshops would have been able to spin their yarn five or ten times faster with this machine and go and do other things. But once Arkwright had perfected his machine, had his patents granted, he didn't let people use this machine. So that's, that's how the patent was used as a mechanism of control. He said, you can license this patent if you have a machine that has 500 bobbins, 1,000 bobbins, not, not 16 like this, not some hand crank machine, but a giant machine that you put in a factory. And that means that you need to be a wealthy industrialist or a landed gentry in order to be able to afford this. Um, certainly, Arkwright had his own mill um, and um, ended up partnering in several others. And Arkwright's mill is really that epitome of the Industrial Revolution. When we think of William Blake's dark satanic mills, belching pollution and providing an unsafe and horrific place to work, that's very much what it was like. William's, uh, Rich, uh, Arkwright's um, Compton Mill had 1,200 employees, two-thirds of which were young children, and they worked 12-hour shifts. The, the idea of involving children in the production of textiles was not new. They would have been working in textiles on the farm at home. But doing so in a factory setting was, was an invention very much of Arkwright's. And his mill set the tone for the next century or two centuries of what um, industrial manufacturing would look like. His mill is a great big brick construction. In the gateway sits a cannon loaded with grape shot, which is, of course, an anti-personnel weapon for tackling crowds who want to come in and destroy his machines because of the effect they had on the landscape. This is another example of an industrial scale textile technology from late in the 18th century. This is actually not an Arkwright frame. This is a spinning mule. Um, the difference is just that it has a giant carriage that, that reciprocates, goes forwards and backwards. And this, this mimics the, the effect that you do with a spinning wheel when you bring your hand in and out to draft the yarn. And it, it lets us spin longer fibers and finer yarns, but otherwise is, is fairly similar. And similarly, it was only licensed for large mills. You can, this one's a, perhaps a really good example of the sort of livelihood problems that this generated. There's two main jobs working in this mill. The first one is the child who is working cleaning the floor in there. The mill, this thing will be as, as long as this auditorium. This rack on wheels goes in and out fairly slowly. The child has to go in, clean the fallen yarn and debris off the floor, and ideally get out before the mill comes in and crushes them, because you, you can't turn it off, not easily. The, the other main trade is the doffer, who uh, has to, when the bobbin is finished, take that off, reattach the next yarn while the machine's still in motion, which is mostly safer, except that uh, it turns out, and this machine was in operation until about the 1920s, turns out that the, these bobbins spinning and lubricated at waist height are throwing out oils, and a lot of these workers died of scrotal cancer. So all throughout the history of, of textile machinery, we have machines that are invented for social purposes other than the well-being and right livelihoods of the workers and other than distributing fairly the, uh, the result of their efficiency gains. The result of this, of course, was social unrest. So we've all heard about Luddites, and the term Luddite gets used these days to mean someone who's anti-technology. So the Luddites were people in Britain rebelling against this industrialized form of textile production and trying to break the machines, hence the reason why Arkwright had a cannon. Um, there wasn't really a person called Ludd. It was more of a, a character on their posters who they, uh, they were associated with. But the, um, the Luddites weren't, it would be incorrect to characterize the Luddites as being anti-technology. The Luddites were really anti-control. We've seen how these new technologies, they could have been ennobling and instead they were used, perhaps through legal mechanisms, as a means of centralizing control and giving much of the wealth and the efficiency returns they generated to the plutocrats rather than the workers. So the, uh, the Luddites fought many battles through the 18th century and the early 19th century and, and ultimately lost. Um, and uh, the machines that they were fighting were, were clever ideas, but in the end, resulted in negative effects. The, um, the, purpose of, um, the, the purpose of these technologies 
was to enrich society, and the, um, the purpose of our intellectual property law that we associate with them was to reward their inventors. Um, but it's clear that if we're going to do that, we need to find ways to do that other than handing them control over what turns out to be really important sectors of society. Textile production in this time period is just about the most important economic sector in Britain, maybe just after food. And so by handing control to the patent holders, we've effectively allowed them to shape the entire socioeconomic system. So we need better mechanisms for doing that. If we imagine doing the Industrial Revolution again, which is something I see a glimmer of, perhaps, in the maker movement and other aspects of the open source community, then we can imagine doing so with different goals. From that first spinning wheel, which people might have been using in the start of the 18th century, through to now, the modern ring spinner, and beyond that, the modern spinners that uses a vortex of air to spin the fibers, there are so many uh, orders of magnitude of efficiency gain. I'm not quite sure how much more efficient a modern machine is, but I, I would not be surprised to hear it was 1,000, 10,000 times more efficient. We've gained so much efficiency there that we can sacrifice some to meet some other goals if we wanted. If we were to redesign the Industrial Revolution with a set of goals based around not just efficient production, but right livelihood, safe livelihood, not mindlessly specialized mechanical livelihood, then we could do so and invent machines that, um, that do meet human needs. Um, this is intended to be an example about uh, the, op the commons and open source. But if you're actually interested in the textile production aspects of what I'm talking about, uh, I do have a website up at Open Source Textiles and a Facebook page if you want to join in the conversation. There are a few people working in the open hardware space in this area, very few. There have been two Kickstarter-funded open source textile machines in the last five years, so there's stuff going on. Um, and you're welcome to participate in that. Thank you very much. <laughs>